And now, AM650 presents your source for leading-edge news and information on today's hottest products and services. This is Experts on Call on AM650. Well, good evening and welcome to Experts on Call. Nice to have you with us as we turn our attention to animals once again. Phil Moriarty is the owner of the BC Canine Training Center, and he's back with us in studio. Nice to see you again. It's always good to see you, Sterling. Last time around, you brought a special guest. You had Rachel Weiss from the Richmond SPCA, and you're not to be outdone again this time. You've got another special guest. Dr. Mike Shoffley is with us. And uh, Dr. Mike, welcome. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, thanks for having me here. Oh, it's good. It's a pleasure to have you. Phil, tell us a little bit about, remind us a little bit about the BC Canine Training Center, and then we'll get Dr. Mike to tell us all about the Richmond Animal Hospital, which is just up the street from where you are, at right. uh, the foot of number three road right there down by the water. That's right. It's a good dog run. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, we've been in business for 12 years, and uh, we train dogs. Uh, we board them, have daycare, and uh, we're uh, second home to uh, a lot of dogs when their parents go away. That's right, yeah. And you have a background in law enforcement. You were with both Delta and Vancouver City Police Departments. That's right. And you were a canine officer uh, when you were attached to the Delta unit. Uh, and was that what sort of got you into dog training, that all those years working with a dog that well, was uh, not only a partner, but uh, a serious backup in a lot of situations? Is that what sort of got you leaning towards uh, dog training as a as an eventual career? Yeah. Um, you know, having to go through the training and um, uh, learning a lot more about dogs and and um, how they react and how, how faithful they can be and that sort of thing. You know, there's a bond that develops. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, once I got out of law enforcement uh, in, in the mid-90s and set up my other companies, um, I had an opportunity to pick up a place in, in Richmond here that was uh, already in business. Uh, but I wanted to convert it to public use, and um, uh, that was a great opportunity for me to start training again. Mm -hmm. and, and you've got five acres of property, which is and uh, various uh, kennels and uh, lots of room for everybody and all the tenants. Lots of exercise. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Mike, uh, we we found out moments ago that you're a trombone player. Uh, Phil is a Correct. singer, and might this be the beginning of some kind of collaboration Maybe, down that the road? Maybe that would be kind of fun. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about yourself, Dr. Shoffley. You're from uh, Alberta originally, and we'll try not to hold that against you. Well, thank you. Yeah, I'm originally from up the Edmonton area, Shore Park. And okay. uh, that's where I grew up and went to school, and I went to the U of A and then the U of S, uh, where it's even colder. Mm -hmm. um, but I survived that, and I practiced in Edmonton for about three, four years, and then I was in Langley for a little while, and then I've been in Richmond for the last 20, just over 20 years. I bought the Richmond Animal Hospital at that point, and uh, it's been in business for about 55 years. Right. The original practice of Richmond. Um, and so... It was a, a pretty going concern when I took it over, and we've been trying to uh, just continue building from there, offering as good a service as we can. Right. Um, and, and I wanted to ask you about the, the practice. Is it mostly uh, predictable dogs and cats stuff? I mean, there are. it's a big city. People right. collect all sorts, of, all sorts of strange pets. Right. So it's primarily dogs and cats. All right. Um, but we do a lot of exotics, uh, both. They'll uh, even take your snake. Oh, uh, exactly. Myself and my one associate, we do a fair number of exotics. He's a little nervous of snakes, but he'll do them. Uh, I've seen a caiman, um, the odd spider and fish here and there, but lots of pocket pets, rodents, uh, gerbils, guinea pigs, oh, rabbits. Pocket pets. Lots of birds. <laughs> we actually just had an unfortunate experience at our hospital. We used to have two birds, and uh, a couple of weeks ago, both of them. Uh, one of them had a traumatic incident and uh, and is, and died, and then the other one had bone cancer, and she died about a week ago. So these were like the mascots yeah, of the clinic? Our, and so it clinic must be kind of quiet around there. It's a little quiet around there. I'll um, bet. With the, with the exception of the hammers and, and things that are going on because we're renovating right now. Ah, I wanted to ask you, just to, to picking up on the BC Canine Training Center, as a veterinarian, yeah. when someone brings an animal into you for, uh, for treatment of some kind, yeah. is it noticeable immediately that you're dealing with an animal that's had some training or not? Is it pretty uh, easy? Absolutely, yes. I mean... If they're if they're pretty traumatized, not always because they can't always lift their heads up. But, sure, sure. You know, in other regards, absolutely. You know, they come in. Sometimes they're sitting calmly in the waiting room. Other times they're barking and jumping and 
jumping on other people that are out there, other dogs that are out there, and the odd time there's a little scuffle mm-hmm. going on in the waiting room, or, or I walk into the exam room and I, I can't even talk to the client because they're barking their heads off. Um, and so, and others are calm and quiet. I'll sit there, jump on the exam table, jump on the chairs, you know, to allow an examination. Certainly makes my life easier when they've had some training. Uh, Phil, when you train dogs uh, at the BC Canine Training Center, uh, I mean, obviously they're going to, all dogs, one can only hope, will encounter a vet uh, at least once a year along the way. Uh, What sort of training uh, do you you deal with in terms of, of people being able to handle their dogs when they're in an alien environment, like a veterinarian's office, which smells funny, which has other animals in it, some of whom are pretty worked up. Mm-hmm. What sort of training methods work in that kind of hyper environment? Hopefully they've already seen the vet before they come to us because we require all dogs coming into the kennel to have all their shots up. Okay, good to know. Um, so, um, but I, I guess hopefully the vet would see a difference in the dogs once, they <laughs> once they've <laughs> been in for, <laughs> in for training then, rather than the first time. Right. Uh, a lot of people... Um, uh, you know, don't really know why their dog is behaving the way it behaves. Um, when we when we get a dog in that um, uh, is just a young puppy, you've got a different dynamic than sure. you do when you've got a fully grown dog who has had several years under its belt of uh, doing nothing but whatever it wanted mm-hmm. and, and doesn't know the difference because it's just acting like a dog ass. Sure. Um, once the once the training starts, though, the you know the the, the hill to climb is um, uh, getting the people to to learn the the, the tricks. Once the uh, w- once we send the dog home, right, and then when the dog goes home and goes to the vet, hopefully they can control the dog a little better in the atmosphere when they when they take it there. Right, right. You, you can probably see, doctor, e- even more whether or not the the people bringing the dog in have any sense of what the dog is doing. Um, you know, uh, by allowing it to bark and all that sort right. of thing. So, you know, the dog is just being a dog, but typically it's the owners who are confused about what they might want right. to do with it. And and sometimes owners, they don't really care. You know, they like the wild and craziness that their dogs are. Oh. And they don't want to take that out of them. And that's their prerogative, I sure. suppose. Sure. But I think <clears throat> for most, <clears throat> excuse me, for most family situations, um, having some control of your pet, makes for an easier uh, living environment for everybody, mm-hmm. including especially the dog. Makes it uh, nicer for visitors to come out make, of here to house. Oh, yes. no <laughs> if you don't have yeah. breeding disorders, yeah. it makes it easier for us. And, you know, from our perspective, when we first see animals come in, uh, especially puppies, but we, you know, we try to treat them all as, as kindly as we can. You know, we try to use a lot of treats and positive reinforcement because I certainly prefer people... Uh, their dogs dragging them into the hospital rather than them dragging their dog into the hospital. Sure, sure. And uh, about four times a year, we put on a puppy party. So we have, we send out invites through mail and email to dogs under a certain age, usually about eight months. And they're all welcome to come down and just have an afternoon of playtime at the hospital. So they have a good experience there. They're so <clears throat> they're being socialized right. with other dogs and other people. Um, dogs of all sizes, little Yorkies to Mastiffs, all running around in the same little area with a bunch of different people and kids and seniors. And, um, and then I'll usually try to talk and, you know, educate people a little bit through that time as well. Um, and, you know, we do that strictly so that those animals have a good experience at the hospital and a good socialization at time. Yeah, I want to come back to the socialization process because yeah. that's huge. But Dr. And, and when they're sick, it's not foreign territory for them to right. come back to. That's right. true, exactly, yeah. yeah. But uh, Dr. Mike, F- uh, Phil was just saying when anyone brings an animal to the BC Canine Training Center for the training regime, it, they insist that that pooch has had all of its proper shots. Right. So would you please remind us of the shot protocols for small critters? Sure. So um, the main things we vaccinate these days are dogs, cats, and ferrets. Okay. Um, The other exotic pets that we see, bunnies and stuff, there are no vaccines for. You know, you get into farm animals, that's a different scenario. Sure. Um, But with with regards to pets, so for dogs, we vaccinate um, at 8, 12, and 16 weeks at one year or a year after their last shot and then every year they're usually due for something okay um a a physical exam the most important part of that Mm -hmm. uh the things that we vaccinate for are distemper 
uh, which is a, a general body virus that is usually fatal, mm -hmm. uh, distemper, hepatitis, uh, parinfluenza, which is an upper respiratory infection, parvovirus, which is uh, vomiting and diarrhea and possible other things. It's often fatal as well. Mm -hmm. um, coronavirus, which is a, another gastrointestinal illness, uh, Bordetella, which is another infectious cough, and um, rabies. When uh, we uh, when you see these ads for puppies in the papers, yeah, and most of them will say you know ready to go uh, six seven eight weeks old, right. already had their shots, dewormed. How right. important is deworming for a little dog? So deworming is really important as well. The Center for Disease Control recommends that they all all puppies be dewormed every two weeks until they're four month four months old. Oh really? Yeah. And is they, it just a pill or something? It's a get? pill or a liquid. Usually, it's what we use is usually a pill. Okay. Um, even if the mom doesn't currently have worms, um, if they had worms as a puppy and were dewormed and never picked them up again, they can still pass them to the puppy through the milk and through the placenta, depending on the type of worm. Interesting. So most puppies are born with worms or pick them up in their in their early stages. Did not know that. Yeah. Interesting. And so, as much as they're not much of a problem for. Uh, the dogs, the worms, you know, they can create issues for sure, but they are also a public health risk because uh -huh. in the environment, um, the humans can come in contact with them. And while we won't get a worm from eating a dog worm egg mm -hmm. or a dog worm, we can get a little cyst that grows inside us. Oh. And as an adult, it probably wouldn't be an issue, but as a child... It can cause migration through the eyes, through the brain, through the lungs, and create significant health issues. So this deworming stuff is really it's, it's, actually hugely important. It's a huge public health thing. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, uh, and I remember, uh, Phil, when uh, Rachel was with us on the last program, uh, she spent a lot of time talking about spaying and neutering as well. Do you mm -hmm. do, and I know you do work with the SPCA yeah. in Richmond yes. uh, at the Richmond Animal Hospital. Kind of a logical connection there, Dr. Right. Mike, and you're only half a mile up the road anyway. Right. But um, how, what's your uh, policy with respect to spaying and neutering? So, uh, well, we don't, we don't, uh, we recommend it. Right. Um, on all animals, unless they're being used for breeding. Right. Because obviously, if you're going to breed them, uh, a neutered animal <laughs> doesn't work that well. Not very, very valuable, um, no. But... Um, counter-reproductive. Counter-reproductive, exactly. <laughs> exactly. The, uh, the recommendation is that they're, they're spayed or neutered at six months, assuming the decision to not breed them has been made. Okay. Uh, it can be done anywhere from about four to six weeks of age and beyond. Um, once animals have... If they're being used for breeding, once that cycle is finished and you're no longer going to use them for breeding, uh, then we recommend spaying or neutering at that time. Okay. There is no um, downside to spaying and neutering other than the lack of reproduction. And Phil, when it comes to bringing an animal to the BC Canine Training Center for a program, uh, or even for boarding for that matter, uh, th I would assume the questionnaire that the owner fills out in advance of, of bringing the dog uh, along, there will be, has this animal been spayed or neutered? Have all the shots been taken? All these boxes have to be checked, right? Yeah, for several reasons. Uh, the, the spaying and neutering will help us decide who it's going to play with and who it might not be compatible with, that sure. sort of thing. Yeah. And uh, you don't want a, a non-neutered male and a non-spayed female coming in as guests and, and um, you know, something happening mm -hmm. that, you, that, mm -hmm. that the owners <laughs> were, yeah. weren't, weren't anticipating. Uh, so, but uh, also for, for the training, if, um, if somebody is going to make a decision sooner or later that they're not going to breed the dog, then we would suggest that they uh, get the dog spayed or neutered before the training starts. Of course. Uh, because it, there's a whole a different, especially in male dogs, if I'm not mistaken here, there's a, there's a diminishment of, uh, well, I don't know what dogs have, but we would call it testosterone. Uh, it is think testosterone. Dogs, oh, I it think is. dogs call it the same thing. They yeah. do. Well, yeah. I didn't know They don't that. enunciate it the way we <laughs> do. But, well, <laughs> but it, 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 with that, with, so if that is is diminished through the the neutering process then it's a much different animal to try to train than a dog who isn't uh, neutered and who's uh, just instinctively or naturally well, more his aggressive right? his preoccupations are different once yes, it's, uh, yes you know when you're trying to concentrate on other things mm -hmm. and part of the part of the training protocol or, or process is that we like to socialize the dogs lots of times uh, dogs uh, when they're on a leash will go past another dog and just go crazy right and uh, uh, but that's not obedience. 
I mean, obedience is when you put the dog in heel and the dog walks. It, it, it takes a look and that sort of thing. It could be very interested, but, but it's still, still going to, it's it's going to it has the self-control. Right, right. And um, so, you know, th- that, that helps to accomplish some of that. All right. This is Experts on Call on AM650. We're talking dogs with Dr. Mike Shoffley from the Richmond Animal Hospital and our old friend Phil Moriarty, the owner of the BC Canine Training Center at the foot of Number 3 Road in Richmond. We'll be right back with lots more. Stay with us. There's still more ahead with Experts on Call, the show focused on delivering relevant and beneficial consumer information. This is Experts on Call on AM650.